Um, welcome everyone. I'm Shep Steiner, Associate Professor of Contemporary Art and Theory at the University of Manitoba and editor of the journal Mosaic. I want to welcome you to the lecture series, Relative Time, Little Time, that the Dutch artist team Vic Vanderpoel developed in collaboration with the journal. I'll briefly say that Vic Vanderpoel's special area of practice involves traversing temporal and spatial topologies, archival politics, activating situations, and how dialogue and discourse shape the public sphere. We couldn't have organized this conference without them. Before I thank our sponsors and introduce our speaker, I want to acknowledge the traditional land on which the University of Manitoba campuses are located, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you to our sponsors, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the University of Manitoba Conference Sponsorship Program, and lastly, the Faculty of Arts, the School of Art, and the Institute for the Humanities, all at the University of Manitoba. As for questions to our speaker, please refrain from interjecting until the end of the lecture and realize you will be recorded. Your consent is appreciated. In the chat thread, simply indicate to my co-host Carolyn DeCorno at Carolyn DeCorno or Timothy Brown at Timothy Brown that you have a question and one of them can unmute you. Carolyn is Mosaic's managing editor and Timothy is our conference assistant. If you can ask your questions with cameras on, that is greatly appreciated. Lastly, I remind you that our next lecture is tomorrow at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time with Dr. Paul Hubner. Now to welcome our invited speaker, Dr. Denise Ferreira da Silva. She is the director of the Social Justice Institute at the University of British Columbia and both an academic and practicing artist. Her work addresses the ethical political challenges of the global present with particular emphasis, I think, on raciality as a temporal predicament. So the question of relative time, little time is near at hand. I first encountered her very compelling work on violence, value and blackness in the film work, Infinity Minus Infinity by the Autolith Group. But I think I probably have already said too much because she puts race, colonialism and contemporary capital in relation and motion in ways that are more complex than I can articulate or summarize using these keywords. Her books include Toward a Global Idea of Race from 2007, Adivide Pagavel from 2019, and Unpayable Debt, which is forthcoming. With Paula Chakravarti, she co-edited Race, Empire, and the Crisis of the Subprime in 2013. She has collaborated on a number of films with Aruna Newman that includes Serpent Rain from 2016 and Four Waters Deep, Implicancy from 2018. And she has worked with Valentina de Sidere on the relational projects, Poethical Readings and Sensing Salon. Her presentation today is titled Negative Accumulation. Please welcome Denise Ferrer da Silva. Thanks, uh, Shep, for the invitation to be part of this amazing, this amazing program. Um, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I speak from, to you today from the unceded ancestral lands of the Muscan people, where I have lived and worked for the past seven years. And I also always uh, like to express my appreciation for their hospitality as we inhabit their lands under settler colonial domination and as they and, uh, and as we uh, deal with uh, ongoing racial violence. So as Shep said, the title of my presentation today is Negative Accumulation or That Which Happens Without Time. Um, 
let me say from the outset that what I am sharing with you today is work, work in progress. I'll be talking about reflecting on something that I first put in writing a few years ago, but also it also includes some ideas that may never gather in a conventional uh, shape. Fuzzy, I think, is a good descriptor for the approach, and only also because uh, fuzzy is how what I'm attempting to grasp and convey, how it has figured in our thinking uh, all along for a long time. Anyway, so I first used uh, the phrase negative accumulation in the essay uh, titled Unpayable Debt, which was published in 2017 as part of the document 14 Reader. While I do not elaborate on the idea in the book version of, of Unpayable Debt of the essay, which is, as Shep said, is coming out eventually this year, if the paper supply chain, supply chain uh, normalizes, that book does explicate the phrase further because in the book I elaborate on the, the background and also some, uh, brings out some details of the larger argument, which is about uh, decolonization. It is about an approach to decolonization as the only appropriate descriptor for the goal, as the goal uh, of any political program that confronts global capital or you know, that confronts the current shape of the post-enlightenment version of the liberal, uh, of this liberal juridical form that you know, some of us call state capital. So I'm not going to be talking about decolonization as such as the uh, political project of our times, but it is all over and this reason why, um, you know, anything that I say, I believe makes any sense uh, or, or should have any interest, should, should be of, of any interest. Now, when, when the phrase uh, negative accumulation first came to mind, I was looking for a term to capture what could be described as um, the trajectory of Black and Indigenous persons and collectives, but also of other former colonized persons and collectives in the past 200 years. Um, what I had in mind back then, or perhaps um, I should say that the exercise, that exercise was mobilized by uh, a uh, preoccupation with uh, something that was happening back then in the early 2000, I mean, yeah, early 2000s, uh, which is with how those with nothing or blamed for financial losses of those who attempt to profit from their, you know, from their lack of asset. So how is it that that black and migrant persons uh, were blamed in talking about the US or blamed for the global economic crisis of 2007? 2008. Um, negative accumulation was the descriptor that seemed most appropriate, appropriate when I first thought about today's presentation also. Now, as you know, I present in the midst of yet another global crisis in which Black, Indigenous, and certain migrant persons and collectives from Europe's post-colonies have once again uh, been the worst affected. Uh, in terms of the disproportional numbers of infections in that, those populations, the uh, numbers of in, the instances of severe disease and death from um, COVID-19. Now, I find negative accumulation the, the, the most appropriate descriptor because considering the question of time in this context, now I'm thinking here in this early 21st century, it is almost impossible if that consideration does not also address what I'm calling um, negative accumulation, or rather I'm using negative accumulation as a name for. Um, and a negative accumulation is you know, this contradictory, fuzzy, ambivalent proposition, which uh, suggests several things, but here I'm thinking primarily of a suggestion of a temporal process of a the accumulation of something undesirable, bad, pernicious, etc., and then b of accumulation with a negative value. Um, so the question orienting these reflections today is how to think of accumulation 
which one considered as an ongoing process may have led or lead to an excess, right, accumulation. How to consider that in terms of deficit as the accumulation of something that has led or may lead to a loss. Um, so the first sense, I think, recalls the global economic crisis of 2007, 2008, persons and families with the lack of assets of equity forced them to take the subprime, so-called subprime loans uh, that were used to make financial instruments uh, that uh, would which were excessively valuable, so excessively valuable that the whole, you know, the global economy threatened to collapse uh, when those holding these instruments even thought about uh, cashing, cashing them. So if in that case, negative accumulation, in that case, negative accumulation refers to this pernicious, accumulation of a pernicious value. So in the second, uh, I think it recalls the case of the, uh, of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. So we find that BIPOC persons and populations are the most likely to con contract and experience severe symptoms and die of SARS-CoV-2 infection, precisely because of their physical, not uh, pre-existing health conditions and their social conditions, right? Uh, given that whether it's overcrowded housing and the, the kind of jobs they have in these so-called, um, but actually truly essential services. Um, so those conditions, physical and the social ones render them more vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable to, to the, the disease. So it's undesirable here what gives accumulation a negative value are the health conditions, high blood pressure, diabetes, and the social and the social conditions, low paying jobs in transportation, health, and, and care industries. So what I'll do, and I'll do it very briefly in this presentation, is to consider the question of what makes it possible, something social scientists say all along, but never bother to question, which is that BIPOC persons uh, the accumulate deficit. And, and I think the reason why social scientists don't explain it because they assume that racial or cultural difference that is as a cause of exclusion, discrimination and oppression uh, are what causes uh, those conditions kind of like immediately. I'll say more about that. So I should say that I'm not about to propose another a, a racial theory. What I, I'll do is to comment on a few aspects of an analysis of the political that foregrounds how the colonial and the racial have been crucial to the accumulation of capital. That is its very existence, um, you know, over the past 500 years, but in terms of the racial over the past 200 years uh, in particular. And this exercise, which is basically speculative, right? I'm just asking what if we thought about this way. Um, this exercise is guided by three simple questions. Uh, the first two are contemplated here, even obviously superficially and briefly, and the third is not. Uh, the first one is about time, <laughs> in particular, how racial subjugation, how considering racial subjugation in regards to time. And I do so by revisiting how time operates as an economic and an ethic element in Marx's account of capital accumulation, but mostly as an economic element. Uh, the second qu guiding question is about value. And then I return again to the equation of value uh, in, as, present, as presented in chapter seven, volume one of capital. Uh, also very briefly, I'm not gonna quote much. I'm just going to maybe uh, even repeat things I have said, I have said before. Um, and then the third and final question, which is the one I don't cover here, but, which, but the one I want to mention because it's related to, to the political uh, significance and urgency of decolonization, um, which is you know, the whole point of this exercise. Uh, it is about the correspondence between violence as applied to extract labor under cap and land under capital and the indifference in thinking in terms of um, decisions related to the global, uh, to, the, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it, to those as descriptors, um, to those, and, but also in, in regards to descriptors such as exhaustion, uh, 
um, about which I won't say much, but uh, extraction, um, about which I'll say a bit more. And, uh, and the ways in which attending to these two violence and indifference, racial violence and indifference, exhaustion and extraction, allows us not only to appreciate how capital manages to reproduce even under apparently dire circumstances when everybody's announcing its end, it just comes out back stronger, but also how any proper critique of global capital need, need to take seriously ecological and racial critiques. Because the excess of the extraction, which cannot return within the acceptable working of things, no, acceptable as that which is in time, of time, and it's measurable, et cetera, that excess has among many consequences, uh, both the exhaustion that marks the daily existence of BIPOC populations, as well as the accretion of harmful gases that's causing um, global warming with the, with the effects we are you know, living now. Obviously, I will not be able to not even think about elaborating the latter connections, but I, I do signal, I want to signal how um, it can only, these connections can only become evident when thinking proceeds without the privileging, actually, if thinking proceeds against time. A uh, racial event or that which happens without time. And I'll open with a quote from Frederick Douglass. Um, I quote, the slave master, it, master's interest in describing the black man as fit to slavery, discrediting the personality of those he held as property. Every man who had a thousand dollars invested had a thousand reasons for painting the black man as fit only for the slavery. The holders of $200 million worth of property in human chattels procured the means of influencing press, pulpit, and politician. And through these instrumentalities, they belittled our virtues and magnified our vices and have made us odious in the eyes of the world." End quote. Reading Frederick Douglass' The Color Line, uh, it is unavoidable to wonder how is it that so much has and yet nothing seems indeed to have changed in regard to deployments of total violence against Black persons between 1881 and 2021. There is no answer in this question immediately. So when considering deployments of total violence as a political event, the key is to focus not on the specific conditions of deployment, but on the general form under which those, those deployments of total violence are justified. This is an important distinction I'm signaling here because, uh, which is precisely that between those deployments that are considered criminal, morally and juridically unjustifiable, and those which are seemed necessary to justify their self-protection or self-preservation, whether juridically, objectively, like you know, the different cases of, of uh, cops that have been acquitted from killing black and brown persons, or uh, morally, uh, subjectively justified as self-protection. And that you know, may or may not be juridically justifiable too. But what I want to take to do here is to take Douglas' reading of the color line for what it was, I think, an articulation of the term which is very different than how the phrase came to be interpreted in the 20th century, in which it became a descriptor for racial segregation and racial discrimination and exclusion. Um, this is the sense one finds, for instance, in W.E.B. Du Bois's rendering of, of it in the Philadelphia Negro, and I quote, in all walks of life, the Negro is liable to meet some objection to his presence or some discourteous treatment. And the ties of friendship or memory seldom are strong enough to hold across the color line, end quote. But that's not necessarily the one we find in Du Bois' later book, uh, one of his later, bo later book, uh, Dusk of Dawn, in which I quote, he says, the problem of the 20th, century is a problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America, and the islands of the sea." End quote. In that formulation, the emphasis seems to be on relations 
rather than on the on the effects or form of the relations, right? Effects, discrimination, segregation, exclusion. This latter emphasis like on segregation has been the one accepted and is the one at the core of the explanations for racial subjugation. At the core of what I call the racial dialectic, which places racial difference, physical difference as the cause for racial differences, social difference with the explanation that that white, undesirable, no modern, no equal, negative um, uh, attitudes and sentiments toward BIPOC persons inform the, their discriminatory exclusionary praxis, which can be individual, collective, or institutional, right? The, the praxis that keep uh, BIPOC persons in the lower social positions, the lower economic and juridic positions. Um, the racial dialectic explains racial subjugation by attributing it then, or explaining it as an effect of negative ethic moral aspects and becoming moral and intellectual traits of white persons or social systems, which place blacks, for instance, in unbecoming social conditions in which they develop the unbecoming moral intellectual traits, or in this case now, uh, this is the explanation for the global economic crisis that was and then for the health crisis, global health crisis of today, uh, presented in terms of systemic causes, right? Institutional systemic racism that make more, some more likely to die from COVID-19 infection. So, so they're pernicious for existing and social conditions are what explain, um, are led, are, are an effect of, uh, of systemic racial discrimination or, uh, or exclusion. Now Douglas's rendering of the coral line and Du Bois's later uh, rendering of the, the phrase in, in Dusk of Dawn do not immediately yield that meaning, that subjugation is an effect of negative personal or societal beliefs, ideas, and practices. In, the, in, in Douglas' critique of the then no, late 19th century US prevailing explanation for, race, for black subjugation, he says, some other things such as, for instance, I quote, out of the depth of slavery has come this prejudice and this color line, end quote. For him, color line is neither the effect of a natural white mental, moral, intellectual attribute, nor is racial difference expressive of black person's mental, moral, intellectual attributes. For him, and he says that explicitly, um, once those quote, and quote, quote, undesirable conditions that are coupled with a black color disappears, there will be no color line drawn. So his description of the color line, um, in his description of the color line, blackness, uh, blackness becomes a condensation of the juridic and, the com and economic components of the colonial political architecture, which had been, uh, which in the case of Soleil had been uh, lost to you know slave owners due to uh, to emancipation, and that that line now becomes uh, associated in, as blackness. Blackness becomes a correspondence of that of that juridic economic formation. But anyway, returning to the two senses, to the correspondences, to the idea of negative accumulation, it can be said that uh, the latter. Uh, if thought as an accumulation of something undesirable, pernicious, meaning negative, would be an effect of the racial dialectic in which racial difference is both the significance of Black and Indigenous persons um, or collectives, more intellectual attributes, which whites or the society in, in general find negative, and also of the effects of the, the, these negative uh, beliefs and practices, meaning of the social conditions of subjugation in which they are found. So the racial dialectic as a social scientific explanation for racial subjugation, gives, it gives the force of necessity as conveyed in scientific universality to those negative social conditions caused by discrimination and segregation. And in doing so, it takes attention away from what Du Bois' second articulation of the coral line um, highlights in which, you know, in the one in which he describes it as a relation, uh, as not necessarily guided by natural racial attributes, um, but by the thousand reasons mentioned by Douglas in his 1881 article on, on the color line, meaning that, that economic interest 
in the juridic form of the slavery and the colony are actually what is, uh, what is at work. Anyway, a crucial effect of the racial dialectic is being to take racial subjugation and with the also colonial domination to take them out of time. Um, as whatever results from natural reactions might be traced uh, to its origins in time, to a beginning of sorts, but it does not belong to time because it does not change. The only change possible would be the elimination of what of that which generates such reactions. Here we are in, in the realm of necessity, not liberty, to use uh, Hegel's language of spirit as nature, not as um, in its shape as history. Now, I do not think that the solution would be to write the racial back in time. Um, not because, or to move the colonial out of the sectional time and extend it. Not because, as Douglas also suggests, the reason it functions so um, so well as a way of, of a as a political tool is precisely because it is not of time. Uh, talking about the racial, because it allows for no change, because it refigures necessity, and as such, as a tool for explanation, it also offers immediate an immediate justification for what it describes. However, this does not mean that it is not possible to describe how the racial operates as a mechanism of power in post-enlightenment, in the post-enlightenment political architecture, and as such, how it facilitates uh, capital accumulation as that which allows one to identify the moment of the process of accumulation in which it acquires um, a negative value. That is the excess that does not count in the calculation of capital precisely because it is not in time. And as such, it is not measurable, though it is definitely included in the exchange value of the, the commodity. Um, that's possible to do, and I'll go back to that soon. Anyway, when the color line was articulated to figure segregation and Jim Crow in the late in the later uh, 19th century and early 20th century, the common constructions were that it was a badge of inferiority of slavery or servitude, or the cause of quoting a feeling of inferiority. To be sure, both of these meanings were to be central to the arguments for racial equality and the works that be, uh, and the works that belong to what I call the historical version of um, sociology of race relations. Evidently, because when the color line is presented as a badge or as the cause for a feeling, it fits perfectly in the interpretive moment of the modern epistem and can be reconstructed in psychological, anthropological, or even literary terms. But neither set of uh, disciplinary tools and formulations, however, can capture Douglas' description because his argument suggests that a process of transformation of the same components had occurred, one in which in the post emancipation era, blackness seems to afford, afford anyone or, a, or any institution um, that's not named, identified, or constructed as black, it affords the, the juridic authority to deploy total violence. So that same juridical authority that once was afforded to the, to the owner of slaves and then to, and to white persons during slavery. Um, as such, in my view, uh, Douglas's rendering of the color lines, perhaps the earliest announcement of what I call uh, the racial event, that is uh, this analytical tool that instead of explaining black and indigenous subjugation as the effect of unbecoming negative, but not properly modern ideas and practices actually described them as an effect of the proper operations of the liberal political architecture. What this tool allows is to expose how racial violence, both physical, total, and representational partial violence is sine qua non for global capital as a condition of possibility for capital accumulation under the hegemonic form of financial capital, but also before of industrial capital and merchant capital. Uh, and it does so precisely because it confronts the temporality characteristic of uh, post-enlightenment thinking which in liberal and historical materialist accounts, uh, which prevails in liberal and as well as historical materialist accounts of the political. This temporal sequential thinking, as Glenn Coulthard has argued, accounts for a, 
for the historical materialists avow of the significance of the colonial juridic economic architectures uh, of that which the racial is uh, also a reference. Um, this as a materialist tool, the racial event displaces temporal thinking um, and, the, and also its imposition in the cessation of and presumption of separability. And instead, it allows the analysis to move and read back then and over there as constitutive of what happens right now and right here, and, as, uh, and what is there to happen uh, to take the elements of any episode, uh, as well as, sorry, as what is, has there to happen. It also allows to take in the elements of any episode of racial violence as prime matter for thinking and to read what happens. Um, and then at the same time, it takes what happens and what has there to happen as always a material composition. All is already a moment that is singular, a singular assembling of that which also constitutes what has happened and what is yet to happen. Just a note because I can't elaborate on it, but it is important to highlight that my thinking of materiality here refers to matter in its quantic and cosmic presentations as the tiny things that have been entering the composition of everything since the earliest moments of the cosmos as we, so that which exists always as matter energy and in, in this transformation back and forth and matter energy. Thinking at this level of entanglement demands that we abandon or decenter time, Einstein's fourth, fourth dimension. I'm not even talking about Newton's absolute time anymore. Um, but, but time is so conceived as the arrow of time, which accounts so much for the prevalence of uh, sequential thinking. Um, the racial event describe any moment of occurrence as always already a composition already a composition and necessarily similar to other possible composition. So analytically, when attending to the similar, one necessarily looks for symmetry, that's for correspondences, but by attending to symmetry or looking for similarities, it's possible to image, uh, recompose the context under observation as a fractal figure. Um, that is, instead of looking for causal, linear connection, compositional thinking, material thinking, seeks to identify patterns, uh, but not patterns as abstract ones, but actually uh, compositions that repeat in different moments and modes of presentation. In the case of the racial event, in the case of the, in the case of the racial event, the pattern in which ran the racial violence justified because necessary includes a juridic, an economic, an ethic moment, and they need the racial figures in as the symbolic. Each episode of racial violence includes the ones that happened before, um, even before the racial came to play, uh, the political symbolic role it received in the second half of the 19th century. But it reperforms this operation in its formal material and material components. And for this reason, even, even if separate, separated in space time, all of these instances, all of these events are deeply implicated. Each iteration of the racial event explains how racial violence protects property, the juridic economic relationship that joins uh, state capital. Though capital has shaped, shifted over the past 500 years or so, the racial recalls an authority that sustains the ethical force of property, the one that authorizes morally and juridically total violence, and an authority which has remained fundamentally the same in all the dominant guises of capital, merchant industrial, and now in the dominant uh, financial guise. Negative accumulation. Let me quote from Horton Spillers because that this question uh, is very much very much guides this uh, exercise. So Spillers ask rhetorically, we might as might well ask if this phenomenon of marking and branding actually transfers from one generation to another, finding very symbolic substitutions and an efficacy of meanings that repeat the initial the initiating moments. Um, let me close with a comment with comments 
on two correspondences. That, let me start closing this talk with the comments on two correspondence on the two correspondences, the two phrases that ex, that spell spell out uh, negative accumulation. The accumulation of something valued as negative and desirable, the something valued as negative and desirable, and as accumulation of negative value. In the first, which I already deal with elsewhere in the equation of ethical value, value, which I resolved by breaking up the category of blackness to expose how the excess uh, figured as the, the minus sign actually also recalls the indeterminate, uh, infinity minus infinity. Um, so what I do not elaborate in that, in that text on the equation of values, precisely how this uh, calculation is working through what Douglas highlights, which is precisely the fourfold image of the political in which economic thousand dollars, the economic interests met by juridic, um, a juridic modality in the case of slavery would animate symbolic strategy statement that attributes to blackness vices, not virtues, right? The ethic moment of it. The image of the political here highlights how the four moments operate in tandem in racial subjugation, but in particular, how the racial operates effectively because it mobilizes the symbolic force that sustains scientific universality, meaning necessity, and the writing of social, of, the, uh, of a social uh, uh, moral subject that does not share in the distinguishing attributes of humanity. That is, it is a component of the modern ethical text, which has ruled in the post-enlightenment um, along with humanity, uh, which is the, the figure that belongs in time and expresses liberty and equality. That got a little garbled. So here the, the companion is uh, raciality or the racial, uh, the term that I use, um, to refer to this concept. Obviously, this description of the liberal political architecture does not address the racial in regards to negative accumulation. Um, in particular, it does not break with the thesis of accumulation of the negative, which racial dialectic explains and justifies. Yeah, it doesn't. What it does, however, is to provide the possibility for a critique of the very account of accumulation of capital and with it at least one possible way of rewriting the account of accumulation of capital. So let me present some aspects of such reading of global capital, capital by focusing on my second guiding question, the one on, on value. Here I would like to recall another crucial statement of Marx in capital, perhaps the most fundamental, which is about how that which creates and recreates capital surplus value is contingent on time. There is no surplus value if part of the social time needed for the production of exchange value is not retained by the capitalist. When considered from this simple vantage point, the centrality of time, both as what delimits capitalism as a particular mode of production that emerges historically, but also as what determines the particularities of capitalist production, the accumulation of capital can be rewritten in such a way as to make it possible to capture how it also includes a negative value. For that to be possible, we need to take into account two renderings of the negative as something that which is not like or the same as something else. So negative is not, and that and as what is not something else, but it is not, but it's also not something, you know, it's not something else, but it's not some anything as a known. Uh, reading capital, we find slavery and slave labor being mentioned usually in the first sense of the negative as a not, that is as opposed to free or wage labor and as such as not counting the accumulation of capital. That's so, however, because slave labor is not measurable labor. It is not abstract as something that happens in time, not translatable into units break, break, broken into units of time and then divided, yeah and then calculated in terms of what returns to the worker as wage and what is retained by the capitalist as profit, which can be saved, spent, or returned to the production as capital. This is the case because the first gesture, which is the same in every liberal account of a juridic relation, the agreement, the consent to have the product of one's labor taken by others freely through a juridical agreement, that first gesture 
the signature of a contract does not take place between the slave owner and the slave laborer. The capitalist appropriates the total value created by slave labor, which is a mode of appropriation that I call uh, 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 that I call expropriation. But the cap but capital only uh, appropriate part of that the value created by wage labor, and this is uh, what Marx calls uh, exploitation. So, when the analysis of capital attends to both modes of appropriation of value exploitation and expropriation created by labor. It's so also takes into account slave labor. So it's not ludicrous to demand the return of the total value yielded by slave labor and native lands, which is what I call decolonization, the call for decolonization. Because for one thing, it redefines the economic dimension of racial subjugation for grounding both juridical, colonial and symbolic racial violence, the analysis of racial subjugation begins with the acknowledgement that, for instance, emancipated slaves were not only dispossessed of the means of production and of the total value created by their and their ancestors' labor, but that they were also comprehended by a political symbolic arsenal that attributed their economic dispossession to an inherent moral and intellectual defect or deficit. From an economic point of view, it is thus possible to reconsider the post-slavery uh, trajectory of Black folks in the Americas and the Caribbean, for instance, as one of the accumulation of process of economic exclusion and juridic alienation uh, that have left a disproportional, so meaning slavery segregation and mass incarceration that have left a disproportional percentage of them economically dispossessed. So yeah, negative accumulation, otherwise an oxymoron in, in its first, initial, first sense, perfectly describes this context, right? For what slavery as a modality of expropriation has produced is an economic subject, which like the holders of subprime loans own minus productive capacity, precisely because the ancestors, their ancestors labor never counted as um, their property. In that way uh, that Marx says, those of the wage laborers did. Let me put it in another way. The value equation purely economic, regardless of the juridical status, situation of the worker, free or not, is uh, value of means of production plus value of the worker plus uh, value produced by the worker equals the value of the commodity. In slavery, however, the equation is not the same. The value of the means of production plus the values of value of the worker um, plus the value of the produced, the labor produced by the worker. So sorry, in the first one that is, I was caught, I forgot, it's not the value produced uh, by the worker, but it was surplus value. So anyway, that is no, the point is that there is no surplus value or a difference between value produced by labor and the value produced by the worker in the case of slavery. Um, Usually slavery is read as a system of production in which for juridical reasons as property, the slave counts as a means of production, as a thing or a tool. Nevertheless, what if one assumes that insofar as she is a human being transforming raw materials and other means of production through this expenditure of her vital forces, a force into commodities, then the, the slave labor is living labor and as such she has productive capacity and thus she's not a thing. So she should count as they should count as a means of production, uh, as a subject of production. Anyway, my point here is that on the positive side of accumulation of money to be turned into capital that is enabled enabled by slavery, there is an excess, which is the value, the surplus value plus the plus wage that is not registered in the classical historical materialist account of capitalist accumulation. This excess is the value of the worker wage of her labor time, which is retained by the owner, the slave owner. And this transference, it should be noted, is not exhaustive. While the product of one's labor can be appropriated, the labor, the productive capacity itself cannot. Now, so the logic of the liberal formulation of labor and property, which is at the core of historical material, materialism, insofar as it is an intrinsic attribute of human beings, labor itself is not alienable. What the worker sells, for instance, is uh, in the historical materialist account is not labor, power, but labor time. Anyway, 
The access retained by the slave owner corresponds to the economic deficit attributed to the descendants of slaves, which I call negative accumulation or the accumulation of negative things, and which the tools of raciality have sometimes substantiated into a natural deficit, but which is nothing more than the effect of colonial expropriation and later juridic economic, uh, juridic symbolic violence and ethical indifference. So another way that Marx describes capital accumulation is to highlight how it is contingent upon unpaid labor, but not any unpaid labor, such as, for instance, slave labor or domestic women's labor under marriage, a different kind of agreement. The only labor that is product of capital is contractual labor, that is, that is hired by the capitalists under contract for a limited amount of time. This is the labor that's calculated, that's measurable in time and as time and which is considered as proper and positive as form and matter that, uh, that is of capital. Um, and I'm making the case that it's labor labor as a negative value that is not counted should also be counted. But anyway, uh, let me really conclude now by saying first, um, in case it's not uh, clear, that both correspondences, both senses of negative accumulation, when they, they are combined, they add to a closer and I think more adequate description of the accumulation of or reproduction of capital. Uh, that is in the, in the sense that, that profit is first and foremost derived from extraction uh, from the land as mining and ag agricultural production uh, or logging uh, of the land, uh, theft of indigenous lands, as well as extractions, extraction of bodies in the, under slavery from the African continent, but also now from other parts of the world. Then and now from other parts of the world, people are forced to live due to environmental and social catastrophes, as well as uh, the wars of global capital. And of course, of their productive capacity as labor. Those moments of, of the accumulation of capital can be read through the racial event which grasps necessarily without time, them necessarily without time because of how racial difference prefigures the colonial by comprehending the nature of an enslaved as scientific biological tools that write their mental traits without the forms of history and subjectivity. Traditionally, critical racial thinking's response to this effect of the racial has been to present racial matters in terms of connections between back then and right now, the historical ones. So that's not enough. Knowing that Liverpool merchants' profits from the slave trade enabled the emergence of modern banking in Britain in the 17th century does not expose how the racial links these profits and black insurrections uh, in today's Liverpool, Rio de Janeiro, Minneapolis, or Los Angeles. That is how the economic dispossession and policing animating them is part of the same assemblage that is global capital. For that to be thinkable, we need to be able to imagine and also to take into account what happens without time. Similarly, historical materialism fails to apprehend the racial because in the historical stage, property is figured in time that is as something that takes a different abstract form in time. Each successive form is contingent upon new social conditions that are separate from the preceding one in time or contemporaneous one in space. Precisely because separability and sequentiality ignore the symmetry highlighted above historical materialists of today, for instance, ignore the workings of the racial as much as Marx did over a century ago. But when material thinking recalls this symmetry, this correspondence, it fractures it because it creates compo composition, an image, uh, a complex pattern that distorts the linearity of progress immediately exposes the global present as composed by each and every iteration of the racial event and as such as the accumulation of access and laws. If what counts and does not count as value, as of what counts and does not count as value, as well as of all that is wasted and the noxious effects of incessant extraction that now accumulate in the anthroposphere and, uh, and are bringing about what many say is an already irreversible and deadly planetary re decomposition. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Denise. Fantastic. Um, 
Um, Denise has agreed to um, entertain some questions um, for about 20 minutes. And um, as I said in the introduction, you're welcome to um, um, just say in the chat to Carolyn DeCorno or Timothy Brown that you'd like to ask a question. Um, let's see if there's any questions first, Denise before um, I, I have a few as well. Has anyone um, indicated that they would like to ask a question, Carolyn or Timothy? Uh, not yet. Okay. No, not yet. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just, um, begin with, a uh, an inquiry then, um, Denise, um, repetition and refiguration and, um, iteration comes up quite a few times in your, um, argument, um, to speak to the problem of negative accumulation. Could you um, just um, give us a capsule once again of how um, that, um, how those things are folded into one another? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chef, for, for the question. Yes, it, yeah, you picked up on something that is central in the presentation um, and is also important because it should account and allow for the fuzziness that I am, uh, that I want to keep in the, in, the, in, the, in the presentation as part of the presentation of the argument. Now, those three terms are key precisely to the passage um, from addressing what happens, let, let me stay with uh, the qualified ratio. Uh, what happens in terms of racial violence or, or what can be brought under the racial event, moving it from, from the sequential, from sequentiality, from, from, from the temporality of the unfolding or of the progressive that leaves things behind to an approach of that, we, you know, I'm calling it that which happens without time. And without time meaning outside of time in a way, um, and also at the same time without time because it's so immediate in its, um, you know, without, in, in the sense that there is no time in between um, within the operation that all, it all comes, uh, comes up um, very immediately. And then also without time um, as a reference to to Benjamin's, Walter Benjamin's image, right? As that flash, as that which refigures things and and that 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 last um you know that last way of of present of may of describing what without time is standing for is precisely what accounts for iteration repetition repetition all is repetition um iteration one is a different in the every repetition you have a different one because as a racial, the racial event, as an instance of the racial event takes place, that is also a reconfiguration, which I call a re-decomposition of the context itself. Property 500 years ago does not have the same meaning as property that property has now, even though it remains a juridic economic form, but it's a different form. And the ways in which it's a different form has a lot to do with how, you know, with the, the many, many instances of the racial event that has, you know, that have repeated um, over time. So how to capture something? So it's the question, you know, that I, that came to me again, as I was reading uh, Frederick Douglass's The Color Line from 1881. How is it that he's describing precisely what's happening now, right? Uh, and, and how come it is not exactly the same thing? Uh, and how do we make sense of, of this as a political operation, which is what I find uh, he, he, his text makes explicit 
And also, um, I thought it was interesting to see that same term used by him with a completely different meaning as a term would have with a choir 20 years later when Du Bois first, uh, when it, Du Bois uses it in the souls of, of Black folk, when it has moved the meaning. Why, why was it so important that, that that term, the color line, had to be resignified? Because that term, the color line, is what it st uh, would stand for what they called the Negro problem, and then it was called the race problem, and then in the US eventually became race relations, and then became race, as we understand the term. It all goes back to that term, the color line. And in Douglas's iteration, in, when it appeared, when Douglas is articulating it, then it is specifically about the juridic economic uh, form of property and how slave owners were you know, still attempting to undermine uh, emancipation as they did, right? You know, in, the, in the last decades of, of the 19th century. So yeah, so they figured, so go back, going back to, to your question properly, yes, they, they figured precisely because they allow me to convey that which is, is and it's not the same, right? Oh, sorry, I don't know. I always forget that. Um, and how to think, how to take that into account without, uh, you know, also in a way, use, using such terms in, um, in the, throughout the presentation of an argument is on the one hand, also a way of dealing with, with the linearity of the presentation that takes place in time and it's hopeless. So I do repetition a lot, <laughs> as much as I can. <laughs> and you know, you're always like pushing to the limit. This one, I think I didn't do much of that repeating, but I do. So in a, in a way, um, dealing with the linearity of the presentation because, because that's it, right? You know, it's unavoidable. But then also, also at the same time, um, as a way, as a, as a, as an almost an internal call and response kind of strategy, in which the you know the argument gains by being brought by some pieces being brought back out up um, in different in different moments. So that is a lot of um, yeah. Anyway, I was going to say I have I have been playing more and more with the form of presentation. And, as a way of making this academic thing a little less <laughs> of what it is. Thank you, um, Denise. I mean, I, I, I was incredibly interested in the analytic of, that you provide of the color line and its shifting um, um, meanings and forms. And um, if we don't have um, more questions, I'd love to hear um, what you th think about that. Um, how and because um, I I th think I hear you privileging Douglas's notion of the color line a little bit more than Du Bois then because he has something approximating an, a negative accumulation or is that true or not? Um, no, no, just Du Bois, the, the one that everybody likes to talk about, which is Du Bois is of the souls of black folk. Mm -hmm. uh, that is this, you know, preference. The boys of the so it's like Fanon. That is those who like Fanon of the Wretched and Fanon of Black Skin White Mask. It's like the boys of the soul of Black folk sounds. It seems more. Um, I don't want to offend anyone, but it's more familiar than the boys of Dusk of Dawn because that's a communist Du Bois, right? That's a Du Bois more involved and more open and interested and the anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist struggles of you know, the 20s and 30s. So, so on the one hand, yeah, so I like to combine Douglas of 1881 and Du Bois from 1930, uh, because they, they are highlighting precisely the juridic economic form, formation that remains 
now this signified uh, sim in, at the symbolic level, at the level of representation by racial, the concept of the racial and cultural and cultural difference. So um, yes, um, so it's a way also of making of making the case that that is no. You know, all the possibilities that you know, there is nothing new under the sun in the sense that uh, all the elements for a critique that actually allows us to, to really um, address the, those many dimensions of global capital, including the colonial and the racial, the elements were there, they have been there for a long time. Um, but the ways in which the, in the division of labor of different disciplines and political discourses, we have lost it and then, you know, find ourselves fighting for our significance while actually um, we should combine the different forces and advance, uh, you know, a, a critique that is, uh, a critique of capital that is also anti-colonial and uh, anti-racist and has some significance to the issues we have, we are dealing now regarding global warming. Um, so that's why I, I went back. I was happy when I found, okay, Douglas can help here. Thank you. Um, questions, Carolyn and Timothy? Uh, no one's indicated one to me. Uh, no, that I, is I, do, uh, I, I do have a quick question if that's possible. Um, I was just wondering if um, I, I come from, I'm an artist and so that's kind of where I, I kind of enter these conversations. I was just wondering if um, in regards to artwork, um, if time-based media plays an important factor in exploring these new routes away from uh, systems of domination and kind of how to expose them, or if that's just background to um, the importance of just like proper representation um, in these spaces. Uh, much can you say, give me more example, like some examples of how you think time, of a time-based media and how you think it might? Um, I, I guess the, nothing like really specific, just kind of um, idea of exploring like different modes of art. Um, if that, um, the way we kind of explore art as sort of um, like paintings and drawings as sort of um, a static, um, if kind of exploring a new media like uh, time-based media, say uh, Christian Mark plays the clock, um, if that helps to create uh, different modes of thinking or if that's just kind of unrelative to just representation in the gallery space. Well, I think it depends on what you, on how, right? I mean, if if the presentation, if the work is taking an advent, if the work is relying on sequentiality or, um, on the one hand, like if, if, if sequence section is important in, 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 the in the presentation of what the work is, is trying to bring about, or if, if the work is still uh, deploying time or using the time, its time, inherent time aspect to create a certain sense of unity, to keep something like, um, for instance, the, 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 uh, the, the appreciator's position as a unified one that doesn't get lost your time that time gives it if that's the case then doesn't change anything <laughs> right because yeah. deploying time in this you know way in which time has been deployed in the 20 throughout the, the last 200 years in the production in the very production production of 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 the subjectivity that it's that in in the static that gives sense to the static so um and the, by saying that i'm also saying kind of like the, the all the work we do and the transgressions we do in, in, in uh, through artworks are also very much confronted by the limits of this hegemonic time, whether it's the sequential time uh, of history or the unifying time of subjectivity, right? That subjectivity has acquired, you know, from the last hundred years of phenomenology, et cetera. So, but, uh, so, with with Arjuna, you know, we do the we use this time thing, which is a film, and we and uh, from the, the first film, we uh, Serpent Rain, for instance, we um, eventually I'm not going to tell the whole story of of that, but eventually the question, the guiding question for us became, 
how do we make a film without time and against time? Um, and the film became, and the film is the tension of trying to do the impossible, right? The whole thing is about trying to do that impossible, including the long shots of the elements um, that were in which, during which nothing and lots of things happened, whatever. Um, and the other films kind of face the same challenge by focusing on different things, um, with this, you know, constrained by the fact, by, you know, by time, because, you know, films cannot be, I mean, cannot be without time. <laughs> um, so I think, anyway, but I think also um, what's interesting in the whole, uh, in this whole exercise is not so much to identify a media or a, or a form that is effective, but actually all the, that can be done as we try with the forms that we have and, and then try and create and then come up with other forms. We try against time, confronting time, dissolving the effects of time. Um, I think that's what the interesting things will, will come out, right? Um, not getting it right, because that will just become another model another imposition, another form. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Could I ask you, um, the, 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 the film that you mentioned, Serpent Rain, is that, is that situated in Norway? Yes, so this is the film, uh, our, that was our first collaboration and uh, was commissioned by Stefano Harney for the, the Bergen Assembly in 2016. And, um, and the film is about this uh, slave ship that was found off the coast of Denmark back in the 70s. And then it became an evidence that Norway was involved in slave trafficking. So that's, and the, the film was to be in this um, um, installation, uh, The Shipping and the Shipped. And uh, yes, and, um, we so basically it was about you know just talking about slavery and pretty much i mean some of what i, I said here is is in the film but then it just became became more of more than a critique and then also instead of arjuna doing a film about me we kind of collaborated in, in when the question of time the question of time we brought, when we brought the questioning of time to the form, then it became a collaboration. Um, because that, yeah, the questioning in, the questioning in form, the, the kind of film that Serpent Rain um, became. Um, thank you. Um, can I, could I ask you, I mean, about negative accumulation, if it's inversely or asymmetrically related to the kind of, you know, massive surpluses and excesses of capital that we see today, is, is there some kind of asymmetrical relationship there that you're posing in spite of symmetries and getting around symmetries or not? Am I, is that a, is that a, a kind of symmetry that exists beyond asymmetry that that is posed. I think that let's say a kind of the it's symmetry that exists in in the symmetry only because what what becomes what is extracted to become part of profit has been translated into a deficit that is not of an economic order. That is the explanation for racial subjugation or for post-colonial subjugation in general, including talking about countries, you know, it, it has shifted what, what was the effect, what should have been, I, let me say that, what should have been described as an effect of juridic economic expropriation of a juridic economic relation became an effect of a moral deficit and out of the economic, out of, out of the equation. Right. So, but that is an excess in what in profit that is about that corresponds to what has been translated out. Right. So this is what that that this is why when bringing that which has been translated out or transubstantiated, the term I use, 
it is the bringing it out and exposing it within that I, you know, that that is the hope of exploding, exploding it. Um, kind of like in the same way that this excess of extraction is undermining the planet itself, right? I mean, that is, we can think of this accumulation up there in the troposphere as precisely that, that is a too much in, in, in capital accumulation that is not accounted for. And it's usually, um, but, it, but it is either spent or reinvested in, in, in the accumulation of capital, but it doesn't go anywhere. It's like everything else, you know, that exists. This thing is transformed, transduced into something else and it explodes. Um, so that's why, that's the play with negative accumulation. So, so in, uh, in chapter 24, I think it's chapter 24 of volume one capital, Marx is, is about the, um, one of the two on the process of accumulation of capital, the, the first one on the process of accumulation of capital. And then Marx has this phrase about, you know, the absolute zero of wage, uh, of wage, of uh, exploitation, uh, labor exploitation would be a situation in which um, the, the, the capitalist does not pay a wage, right? So there is no wage going to the reproduction of labor. So I was, so I'm also playing with that. That's the absolute zero. I mean, if such a thing is possible, you know, yeah, okay, you can, this, that is a zero in math. And then there is the negative values, right? Anything else. So if the difference between, you know, the crucial difference between slave labor and wage labor is, is the contract, and that's why the slave labor doesn't count. If you eliminate that juridical distinction, slave labor is what, what's there as part of the negative value that it is accum entering capital accumulation. But it's negative value defined in, through this zero, which is, is wage labor laborer who, do not, who does not receive a wage, okay? So that's another way. I, I was going to play with this one, but then that would have required creating another crazy uh, equation, and I didn't want to do it to you. But <laughs> but it's going to come up in in a, in a in another one. So this is another way of figuring it. But it's only so the whole point of so the negative you no know, can be so can show up in these ways, right? The negative the accumulation of negative things, which is the deficit, right? That the charity explains away the expropriation, the moment of expropriation that is crucial for the accumulation of capital and the accumulation of something that has a negative value. So that is the one of the absolute zero, um, being the wage laborer without a wage, who is not a slave, right? He doesn't call it slave, slavery. Slavery is something else because slavery is a different juridic relation. So um, if there is a contract uh, freely, a free agreement, you know, involving two or more people, that is what counts for, cap for capital. So for that, for slavery, even for an, even a negative value, even for including negative values as the values coming from slavery or, and also from uh, colonial domination, then of course we have to eliminate that juridical uh, distinction, which is something I do um, in, in uh, Unbearable Debt. So I play with that and eliminate the distinction and explore, explore that. Right, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the place of the zero in maybe in Gyatri Spivak's maybe reading of demand actually. And so it becomes an allegorical question, the zero. Is that true? Um, yes, yes, primarily. Um, it yeah, it becomes, so the zero, I mean, yeah, because it's also a little, also a lot about the, the you know, the erasure of uh, certain distinctions between, um, for, you, you, you take an equation um, and you, one of the things that I play with is or I experiment with is to treat an equation as as a statement right and then and the resolution of the equation 
The question itself is a statement and the resolution of the question is a way of looking at how the statements put together or how to, you know, be decomposed um, the statement and not treat it as an equation. But at the same time, because it is, it is an equation, it's always, all, it's always possible to play with the two at the same time, with the calculation that gives you value in, in this mathematical way, but also with the statement that in a way gives you an explanation for why something has uh, the value of zero or has a negative value in that. And the same in, in different, yeah, in different texts, I have played with equations to do both. Um, and then, and then, and in that sense, the zero can be, you know, can become allegorical too and can, you know. All right, thank you. I, I, when you emphasize statement, I, do, do we, do we detect a little Foucault or Deleuzean reading of Foucault in, in there or not? Uh, only if it is a violation of both of them. Now, um, <laughs> I, you see, the delusion reading of Foucault is is interesting statement because I, I was proud when I was a, a grad student back in Brazil. I was proud of being in the Foucaultian side of things, not the delusions, because you know the delusions had no commitment to anything political. My generation used to say, <laughs> and I remember. Pre, um, not long ago, I was presenting at the Sense Lab, and I don't know if it was because of uh, Aaron and Brian that I'm talking like, oh, I'm sounding so delusional that the younger me would hate this thing. So, um, yes, it's it's something. It's it's. Um, I think it's a, a it's a, how do I say this. The, the usage of statement in this context has to do with being, uh, you know, a member of a, of a generation and having um, had the, the um, yeah, as I think through, also through reading, studying, thinking with Spivak and Horten Spillers and, and others, going through with, thinking through with an outside and trying to go beyond what, you know, Beyond post-structuralism, I was—I'm a child of, of post-structuralism who is struggling from within, confronting it, um, and and in, in the process maybe going to one camp and not the other and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that was a funny one. Yes, yeah, a delusion reading of Foucault. Yeah. Nice to hear. Kind Thank of. you, um, Carolyn Timothy. Is there one last question? Um, we just have comments um, thanking uh, Denise for, um, would you want me to read them or would you just want Denise to look at them after? Yeah, well, I, I can look at, I'm looking at them now. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to read them, but thank you, Wendelin and Melanie for the, for the comments. <laughs> Great, um, Denise, Thank you for your, your time. It, it's been wonderful. And we really appreciate um, your entertaining our, our questions after your fantastic talk. Thank you. No, thanks Shep, for the questions and Timothy. And thank you folks for staying around. <laughs> thank you for the invite, invitation again. Bye. All right, thank you very much. Great day.